Hi there. Thanks for tuning in. We pray that this message will touch your life and speak into your heart. Enjoy. I am really excited because we are busy with a series called Mastermind. And um, in this series, like you saw, Hope in the Dark will we'll follow the Mastermind series. But tonight with, with um, Mastermind, the title of the preach is Reframing. Now, for some of you, not, you haven't really used that word in a long time. So I thought I'd bring a frame and just give you an, a little bit of an illustration. This is a frame. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go on a little journey or adventure in the Word of God and maybe start placing this frame on different parts of the picture of your life. Does that make sense? That's what I'm hoping that the Lord will accomplish just through the Word tonight and because He is faithful to you. So through this, the reframing, we're actually talking about the power of your thoughts, the power of your thinking, thought patterns. You know, all that stuff that kind of happens up here, in here, you don't really know sometimes where your thoughts are generated from, but the power of your thoughts. And I, I, I read a book, but the title of the book really grabbed my attention. The title of the book was called Unlocking the Power of Your Imagination. Now, I'd prefer to unlock the power of being filled with the Holy Spirit and stuff like that. But before we get there tonight, there is something really profound about our thinking and about our lives. And there's a partnership between what you think and how you live. So, with your, imagine, with your mind, with the power of your thoughts, there's a statement that says the following, what comes into your mind tends to come out of your life. Have you ever thought, thought about that for a second? Just maybe pause and consider. What comes into your mind tends to come out of your life. Matthew chapter 12 verse 35 backs me up and it says, a good man or woman brings good things out of the good stored up in him or her. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him or her. The key word there is stored. Now, are we talking about thoughts and the power of, of, of your thoughts and, and how our thoughts are connected to our lives? But here tonight, I want to just illustrate from the word that this is actually saying, saying where the word stored means there, there are things that we think, not always about others, but a lot about ourselves, that we are storing in a part of our, in a, in a, in a storage box in our thinking. But let me, tell, let me tell us what we are thinking, because we need to take an honest assessment of what you and I think about day in and day out. Now, I know that it's really easy for, for some of you to say, yes, but I think the, I only think the best of you. I put a 10 on your forehead. I honestly, I don't have any negative thoughts because I've got the mind of Christ, you know, and all that stuff. But I want to tell you today, because some of us as Christians and believers, not as orphans anymore as those free in Jesus, still think the following thoughts. What thoughts, Dustin? These ones. I am not good enough. Now, if you think that day, night, day, night, day, lunch, night time, all the time, that's going to happen in your life. You're not going to be good enough. Other thoughts are, I will always just be like this. Other thoughts, this is just who I am. Deal with it. Get over it. Nobody appreciates me. Nobody cares about me. Nothing good will ever happen to me in this one life. Aren't those some thoughts that you and I think? Or, or is this the, the, the positive uh, part of the body of Christ that never has those thoughts and what, 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 what? No, no. The truth is we are faced with these thoughts daily. And unfortunately, we put these thoughts that we face daily in a little memory bank or on a little Bluetooth sticky in here. And instead of having a, a storage compartment that is 
absolutely overflowing with what the Bible says, unfortunately, again, a lot of the time, even believers like you and I, and even if you're an unbeliever, you probably also sit struggling with some of these thoughts where it's just this negative stuff. I will never be a good enough dad. My children disrespect me. I don't know how to control them. I, 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 I don't know how to love my wife. I don't know how to lead my family. I don't know how to love my husband. I don't know how to be a good mom. I don't know even how to be a good sibling, you know, like a brother or sister to my family. I don't even know how to be a good friend. And these things come, and they sit around us, and, and they keep oppressing us, like, um, like that scripture where... Uh, the devil, he prowls around like a lion seeking to devour us. Now, I don't want to hang on the devil, but I don't want you to walk away thinking that, um, that we aren't faced with challenges, trials, tribulations, circumstances, and all sorts of things. I need to remind you today that the war is not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities and powers of the air. The enemy, the dominion of darkness, his scams and his schemes. He has been around much longer than you and I, and he really knows how to be strategic in planting lies around us. So the Bible has a word for all this negative thinking, all these wrong thoughts, all these things that we tend to partner with. Remember, the devil is the father of lies. So when we partner with these things, we're just giving him a bit more of access to some of that think, our thinking capacity. And the Bible calls this strongholds. Ever heard that word strongholds? You ever wanted, ever thought about how do I conquer strongholds? How do I defeat strongholds? How do I break this negative thinking, I call it stinking thinking. How do I get out of stinking thinking and move to kingdom thinking? How do I do it? Because when the Bible talks about strongholds in our mind, these are areas of thinking that are dominated by the enemy. And I'll use the word dominated by the enemy because I'm just asking you a question. Would Jesus approve of those thoughts you and I think? No. Just a good question. We get deceived. We get deceived by something that almost looks like it needs to be a part of our lives. You know those things you, that I said you're not good enough? You're not worth it. And the enemy has a sneaky way of, of almost making us believe that stuff. But listen to what John 8, 44 teaches us, that Satan is a liar. And he attempts over and over and over to get us to partner with these lies. Because he knows if he can get us to partner with the lies, he would start setting our life a little bit off course. I'm not saying you will never walk in the purposes and the plans that God had for you and the, the works that Jesus had set aside for you, knowing, knowing your, your exact existence and lifespan. I'm not saying you'll never walk in it, but I am saying the longer you and I, as sons and daughters of God the Most High, partner with these thoughts we will continue if it's one degree off. I tell you, one degree off over a thousand kilometers, you'll end at a different destination. That is how serious God is about you and I knowing our identity and fixing our identity in Him and what He has said about us. Not what the world and what the Joneses and what the others say about you and I. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have, the weapons you and I have, they have divine power 
divine supernatural power to demolish strongholds. Remember I asked, some of us don't know how to demolish these strongholds, how to get rid of these strongholds, these thinking patterns through our lives. Well, I tell you, the only way we're going to do that is by the Word of God. That is the weapon we have. It is the Word of God. And that alone, obviously with God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, because it is not by might, your might, or your power, or what you think you can do, that would break strongholds in our lives. It is by His Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that will come and do that in my life and in your life. A little further it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought, every thought, every thought, take it captive and to make it obedient to Christ. Because if you take some of those thoughts and you make it obedient to Christ, you put it at His foot and His feet and you walk away, I tell you, that thought cannot be planted in you any longer. He will dissolve that instantaneously for you. But if we choose not to take those thoughts into obedience and into captivity to Jesus, if we choose not to do that, it means we've just partnered with that thought a little longer and we can live with that thing and I pray that we can deal with it much quicker so that that thing doesn't detour us off of, off of the course that Jesus has for us. Are you encouraged tonight because we're challenged? Yes. You know those same thoughts? I'm going to keep saying it. Looking at your life through a part of the frame that is just negative all the time. The picture is so much bigger. So much bigger. But we tend to take this little frame and place it on all the hurts, all the disappointments, all the business deals that didn't go through, all the family crashing and clashing. The finances are in shambles, but, but we're only looking at it through a, a frame in a very small part of the picture. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Circumstances, situations, the book of James even calls them trials and tribulations. All of those things, we are not exempt from those, from those categories. On the contrary, we are going to face all of those things through this life. I'll give, you, I'll give you a little bit of insight into my life. I faced some stuff. You guys have faced some stuff. I faced, my, when I was, I was actually telling someone the story when um, I was one week old, and uh, last year, February, uh, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, my dad's in his fourth marriage, okay, but I said, Dad, why does my mom not feel like my mom? He said, well, my boy, he said, when you were one week old, you were wrapped up in this little blankie, and your mom stood up, and she threw you over the way to me, and I caught you. And she, said, and she said to me, this is your child, I want nothing to do with him. So my mother instantaneously sewed something right then and there. Even me being one week old, I heard it. But it was 30 years later that I got to deal with that. My mother could never recover from my parents' divorce. I was five years old when they got divorced. My dad's second wife was my mom. She became a prostitute and she lived on the Durban beachfront. I used to go visit my mom, school holidays or weekends. I'd take her non-perishable foods. I even took her a can opener. I'd work at my dad's factory, some machinery and all that stuff, and I'd try and earn some extra money. I'd wash his car, do whatever I can. I'd even give my mom some money that I hid away from my dad that I'd kept in my pocket. I'd see my mom, I'd give it to her. My mom couldn't recover in a way, emotionally losing me through the divorce, she conjured up a plan with my grand, my mom's mom, and they kidnapped me and locked me in a cupboard. I, don't, I cannot remember how long I was locked up for. Now, I know some people in this house tonight, 
in this room. And I've heard some of your testimonies, some of the stories you've gone through. But I tell you, I had every reason. I ended up selling drugs for extra income. It was great. It was lucrative. I never consumed it. Don't worry. I just sold it. I was in high school, and there was a business deal. So it sounded good. But I had every reason, every reason to, to view my life through a part of the frame where I could have just become a, a druggie. I should have just ended up like my mom as a hobo on the beachfront. I should have just been on the pavement or, or had committed suicide, which I thought about a lot during my high school career. I had it perfectly planned out. Now, I'm not trying to say my stories are better than yours. But all I'm trying to say is there's a part where we have to take the frame that we keep looking through. There is a much bigger picture that God has painted on a canvas. And we need to position that can the painting, the frame, on a part of the picture that God wants to highlight, not the one you want to keep staring into that keeps taking you down. All right. Reframing. What comes into your mind, what you allow in there, often comes out of your life. 2 Corinthians, Paul is a phenomenal example. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 28. You thought my stories are crazy. Listen, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Yikes, that was probably the most dangerous. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else that he has not mentioned, he says, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches, which is you and me. Paul had every reason, every reason to put his frame on some of those gruesome and difficult facts that he faced. We cannot change the facts of Paul's life. You cannot change the facts of my life. And I cannot change and you cannot change the facts of your life. But you can change. You can change how you frame it. What part of the picture are you going to start framing your world around? Obviously, Jesus. Many times, our frames put apart and we just go through financial crisis. And all we see are the statistics and the figures that don't add up to make it through the month. That's all we see. You may be going through a rough patch in your marriage. Husband and wife, you're clashing a bit. It's okay. It's, it's, it's iron sharpens iron. But I tell you, if you just position your frame in the way God wants you to see the partnership of the marriage, I tell you, you'd reach conclusions a lot quicker. You see some sick people in the city, some lame people in the city, homeless people in the city. You know some orphans. You know some widows. Unfortunately, many Christians, you know what they do with their frame? They say, thank you, God, that I'm not there. When the frame that the Lord would prefer you to see that in is, thank you for what I have, Lord. How can I help them? What can I do? Here I am. Send me, Lord. I'll go. Paul was more concerned about the church, the bride of Christ, 
the gospel, the advancement of the gospel of Jesus than making it through some trial or tribulation. And I want to be sensitive. We go through some real stuff. Philippians, Paul further in Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 to 14, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that, all that jazz and all that stuff, that what has happened to me, I'm including it in the scripture, has actually served to advance the gospel. Right? And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace God, he was in prison at this time, and to everyone else that I, how proud is he, I am in chains for Christ. Preaching in the prison, phenomenal. Preaching in your turmoil, phenomenal. Changing from, from that, that selfish thinking because that is what it is. If you're going to get hung up about I'm not good enough, you're really selfish. You're going to get hung up about I'll never accomplish this, I'll never do this, I'll never what 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 You could, whatever you're facing daily and partnering with, that is not the truth on what Jesus has said over you and I. So he says, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord Jesus. And dare all the more, all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So I thought I'd give us a little bit of a, just a lighter illustration. Is that okay? Can we put our painting up? I've got a painting I want to share with you tonight. Look at this painting. Look at that. It's a beautiful painting. Lo, can I ask for your assistance? So here's a beautiful painting. You can see the sun rising and birds in the sky. You can, see, you can see the glow of the sun upon the waters. It's a beautiful, almost like Peter wanting to walk in the water. <laughs> it's a bit calmer. Then you see some palm trees, some very nice coconuts, and you can just see yourself there cracking one of those open and having a bit of a pina colada, but the non-alcoholic one, anyway. So, long story short, low, can you bring your frame a bit lower? Can you bring it into the black part of it? Right there, right there, a little bit higher. Right there, right there. You have the privilege of seeing the big picture which God gets to see about your life and my life. But sometimes, because we are so limited in our pursuit, are you listening? Because sometimes we are so limited and lazy, I'm going to add that in there, in our pursuit of intimacy with Jesus, we have a very small part of the picture that we are exposed to because we don't want to access the more. It's, it's just lazy, right? It's okay. I'm so sorry. I'm blessing you with a really hard word. It's awesome. Yeah. But when trials and tribulations and hard things come, we put the frame on the darkest part of those things. Our thinking runs wild. Our thinking is bombarded with just negativity and the thoughts that we shouldn't be thinking. Those not good enough. Never going to have enough finances to get married. Never going to make it. Never going to have more children. Never going to have a child. I don't know. It's really hard what we face. I know it is. I don't want to be insensitive. But I tell you, Jesus is really encouraging us tonight to start moving our frame, go high or low, into the part that he wants to highlight. Because when we see what he sees for us, the picture starts changing. The facts never changed. They might not change. Your situation might still be the same. But I tell you, your framing and your frame of reference will have changed phenomenally. And all of a sudden, thanks, Lo, I really appreciate it. And all of a sudden, you start finding your life a lot freer, lighter, and different in those same things while you're going through it. 
But it doesn't come with just positive thinking. A good, a, bad, a good thought doesn't cancel out a bad thought. It doesn't work like that. What goes up comes down. That works. Hmm. But a good thought doesn't just cancel out a negative thought. I'll tell you. God's word is the power, divine power to demolish negative thinking. Rome, in the book of Romans 6, I think it says in 6 verse somewhere, it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And some of us, the only way you're going to move your frame of reference in your situations is when you start moving your frame from the dark, dreadful thinking into the light in the light of Christ. And the only way, the method I can give us for that is by reading his word, spending time in his presence, and declaring the things that he has spoken over us out loud, out of his word, because the Bible is the only ultimate truth. And his word will cancel out every lie and pretension that has set itself up against the word of God over your life and my life. And you cannot control what happens to you. I get that. But you have an opportunity to start reframing the way you've been looking at some of those things in your life. And by reframing it, you will no longer have those negative thoughts about it. And if you no longer have those negative thoughts about it, you are no longer going to have a life that is kind of deviated off of a healthier track in the purposes of God. If the enemy tries to convince you that you're insignificant or unlovable, we need to remind him what God has said. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you've enjoyed this message, then make sure to like our page and subscribe to our channel so that you never miss out on what's happening here at City on a Hill. See you next week.